one of the nice things about technology is um, I can make this print large enough I don't have to wear glasses to read it. <laughs> so, so I, unlike Caleb with his notes, I'm, I'm using the magnifier on my screen. Um, I, t I told Caleb not to announce I was coming because you saw half the church cleared out because I was coming this <laughs> way. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to see you all. Um, I uh, started this lesson with a question. You know, we, we say go to the Word when you have a question. And um, we tell people that, but do we show them our thought process and walk them through it? How, are our, how do our kids learn how to do that? So I started with a question. And um, I'm, I'm, I hit some dead ends in this, and that's okay, because that's how thinking is. And I'm going to take you on a journey with me and uh, hopefully answer. I, I think I learned something I wasn't expecting to, but um, you can be the judge for yourselves at the end, I suppose. Uh, with that said, I'm going back to something Caleb talked about at the end of Mark chapter 6, and I'm starting with verse 45. Jesus immediately, I just lost my place. Jesus had uh, immediately had his disciples get into a boat and cross to Bethsaida ahead of him. Well, he sent the crowd away. After saying goodbye to them, he went up on a hillside to pray. When everything had come, the boat was in the middle of the sea while he was alone on the land. He saw his disciples were straining against the oars because the wind was against them. And shortly before dawn, he came down to them walking on the sea. He tended to go up right beside them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they began to scream. All of them saw him and were terrified, and immediately he told them, Have courage. It's me. Stop being afraid. And this is where my journey begins. Why were the twelve struggling so, and why were they afraid? Now, I understand at this point of time, because I was listening when he was speaking, the disciples didn't get it yet. But I still bring myself back to why. Why do they not get it? After all, Jesus had sent out the 12 in groups of two. In Christ's name, they had preached repentance, and they had cast out demons, and they had healed the sick. And despite seeing these miracles performed at their own hand through the power of Christ, they were halted by the wind, and they were terrified of a ghost. I just could not wrap my brain around the why. They had seen Christ calm the wind, but they had allowed it to stop them now. They had called on Christ to drive out demons and were scared of something they thought was a ghost. It really kind of reminded me of Christ explaining the parable of the farmer in Luke 8. The ones that fell among the thorn bushes are the people who listen, but as they go on their way, they are choked by worries, wealth, and pleasures of life. And I know that the disciples were not worrying about wealth or worldly pleasures, but I couldn't help wondering if they were being choked by the worries of life. And if so, are we any different? Do we get caught up in the day-to-day? -day? Do we get snared by the list of things that need to be done today? The baby crying, the car not starting, the insurance due, etc., etc., etc. Do we just get run down by the storm? Do we get exhausted and overwhelmed and do we too forget where our strength actually comes from? Do we, like the twelve, forget to call on Jesus? And do we get tossed around by the sea of life in our tiny little boat? Well, as you can see, I hit a dead end. Because the twelve, with the exception of one, weren't bad soil. They grew. They become the soil that Luke talked about in, in 8.15, uh, the good soil, and they prove that with their lives. So that leads me back to my question. Why? Why did, they not why did they respond the way they did, with fear? Why did they let the wind stop them? 
Why are they unable to fight it? If you'll turn to Ephesians 4, verse 11, it says, And it is he who gifted some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, and still others to be pastors and teachers, to equip the saints to do work of ministry and to build up the body of the Messiah until all are united in faith in the full knowledge of God's Son and until we attain mature adulthood and the full standard of development in the Messiah, then we will no longer be little children tossed like waves blown about by every wind of doctrine and people's trickery or cl clever strategies that would lead us astray. Instead, by speaking the truth in love, we will grow up completely and become one with the head, and that is one with the Messiah. And now I've found my answer. I have found the why. They didn't get it because they weren't fully matured. Believe it or not, the human brain really does not stop cooking, maturing, till between 24 and 26 years of age. If that's true of the human mind, you can see that spiritually growing up could take some time too. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, because you weren't ready for it, and you're still not ready. Are we not ready? Ready for solid food? Are we like the people of Corinth drinking milk? Where are we ready for meat? Are we still being scared by ghost stories? Or do we do miracles in Christ's name? I believe when Paul states that he is feeding them milk, he is saying that they have learned the basics of Christian faith. That Christ is a descendant of David, that he was born of a virgin, that he died on a cross, and he rose the third day. That's milk. But is that as far as we understand God? Are we too unable to comprehend the mysteries of the gospel because we are just not mature enough? Why do we get choked by the worries of this world? Do we lack maturity in Christ? Is there a lack of meat in our spiritual diet? Are we still children afraid of ghosts? Every year about this time, we have a discussion with fifth grade boys and girls, and we discuss how they are on the verge of maturing and how they are uh, ready to take or start a journey into adulthood. We tell them that this journey to adulthood um, will not be attained at the same pace as their friends. There are many points along this journey that it is normal for people to mature at different rates and they shouldn't be embarrassed if they're the first or the last to go through this stage. But how sad would it be if they stayed there where they're at, never maturing, stuck as fifth graders? What would happen to the state of the union if nobody grew up? This would become the United States of Neverland. Do you want a doctor with a fifth grade education? Do you want a fifth grade pilot? Or a fifth grade soldier? Or a fifth grade engineer? Would you trust the plans of a fifth grade architect? Or a fifth grade surgeon? Are you starting to see the problem with the community of children being in charge? Paul tells the Colossians, Ephesus is always wrestling in his prayers for you so that you may stand mature, completely convinced of the entire will of God. So that you may stand mature, wrestling in prayers so that you may stand mature. Resting in his prayers, folks, sounds like incessory prayer to me. Sounds like he is begging God to help them stand mature. 
And it sounds to me like this growing up thing is important. Resting in his prayers so that you may stand mature, convinced of the entire will of God. So understanding God's will takes maturity. Hmm. Do we explain things to our children today the same as we did when they were three? My mom doesn't. Our vocabularies are closer together. Our life experiences make it possible for her to ana use analogies I understand. She can state an argument that I can reason through and see the merits of. When I was five, sometimes she had to explain to me using the Board of Education. God, too, needs us to mature. We need to be able to eat meat. We need to be able to reason as an adult, to stand mature, convinced of the entire will of God, because a kingdom cannot be ran by fifth graders. Christ left us a great task. He asked us to reach all the people groups of the world spreading his gospel. The task is a dawning one, or is it? I have to wonder how hard the task would be if we were on a diet of meat and not milk. When Christ sent out disciples, according to Mark, he sent them with no money, no traveling bag, not even an extra shirt, and yet they drove out demons, they healed the sick, and they preached repentance. With Christ as their source, they seem to have the ability and the strength to do a very big task for the kingdom. Do we think God has run out of miracles? Does he just not care about his creation anymore? Are we just not mature enough to do the job at hand? I hear people discuss how our world is changing and not for the better. And I have to wonder, is God waiting for us to stand mature? Is he waiting for us to be convinced of his entire will for our lives? Is our lack of maturity what's hindering the spread of the gospel? Right after recording that Christ said, a prophet is without honor only in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own home. Mark recorded that Christ couldn't perform miracles except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them, and that he was amazed at their unbelief. Are we convinced or do we suffer from unbelief? Do we have the faith of a mustard seed or do we let doubt into our heart? Do we thank God no matter how bad we think our situation has become? Or are we like Job, able to take whatever's thrown at us because we know we are in God's will? Do we know that he is our provider? Do we know that he is our strength? Strike that. Are we convinced, no doubt about it, that he is our all in all? that he is alive, our strength, our everything? Are we convinced that he can still perform miracles? Are we convinced he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, that he is the same today, yesterday, and always? I think that when we are standing mature, we might see the world quite differently. Instead of getting down, we might do as the Psalms in Psalms 42 and ask, why are you in despair, my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for once again I will praise him since his presence saves me and he is my God. That's not the answer 
to hard times of one living on a milk diet. It is an example of one convinced of God's will. Not woe is me, but rather why be afraid, for I am in the presence of God who saves me. We must become mature in Christ. We must become totally convinced, for Christ told us in Matthew 21, I tell all of you with certainty, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you be able to do what was done to this fig tree, but you will also say to this mountain, be removed and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. <clears throat> Babies do not move mountains. Babies do not perform miracles. Babies drink milk. We need adult Christians. We must quit drinking milk if we truly want to reach the unsaved. In chapter 10 of Luke, Christ sent out the 70. And I believe the return is a good example of what it would look like to be an adult Christian. The 70 disciples came back and joyously reported, Lord, even the demons are submitting to us in your name. Mature Christians, convinced of God's entire will, were able, through Christ, to force back the evil around them. They were not beaten down by the evil. They stood victorious, mature in Christ, their strength, their source, and they became one with him, the head, the Messiah. Babies must be protected. They must be cared for. But as I tell my fifth graders, as you mature, you will start becoming taller. You will be stronger. You will be able to take on more responsibilities and able to have better judgment and make better decisions. Christ answered that 70 and he said, Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to destroy all the enemy's power, and nothing will ever hurt you. And that means you win. No matter the situation, no matter the earthly outcome, the earthly outcome, you win. You plus Christ is a majority. You win. Our choice seems plain. Feed on milk or grow up and be given authority to destroy the enemy's power. Why did the disciples not get it? They were not fully adults. They were in a state of spiritual puberty, if you will. And they did not mature. They, they did grow out of it. And they did mature through it. And they did become adults in Christ. They trampled snakes and scorpions. As they matured, Christ gave them that authority. And they used it convinced of God's entire will. Can we make the same claim? Are we like the people that Paul describes in Hebrews? He says, we have much to say about this but it's difficult to explain because you've become too lazy to understand. In fact, though by now you should be teachers, you still need someone to teach you the basic truth of God's word. You have become people who need milk instead of solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is still a baby and does not yet know the difference between right and wrong. Solid food is for mature people whose minds are trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. Whose minds are trained by practice. Put your faith to practice. Exercise it. Mature in the Lord. Become all that he has in store for you. Paul tells us that we are already at the right hand of God through Christ Jesus in whom we can do all things. 
Be convinced of God's entire will. Become mature in Christ. For when you are a child, you speak like a child. You think like a child, and you reason like a child. But when you become an adult, you give up childish ways. So go forth, trample snakes and scorpions, push back the evil in your world in the name of Christ, and take your place as a light unto this world, spreading the good news of Christ. Have courage. Stop being afraid. Become one with the head, and that is one with the Messiah. For you are the elect. You are heirs to the kingdom of God through Christ Jesus in whom you sit. At the right hand of God, the God that spoke you into existence. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come to your word and find answers. We thank you that you point out things that we need to know, even when it's not exactly what we were looking for. I thank you for what you teach me as I search your word. And I ask that you would bless this that you have shared, and it would go to our hearts, and that we would go forth in your kingdom, bringing you honor and glory. Amen.